Hey there, welcome to the High Performance Podcast for AFL staff and athletes. Today is a very special episode. It's our top 10 interview-based podcasts from 2023, our most listened podcast by you guys. So if it's a, whether it be a high performance coach, medical, athlete, sports psych, whoever it is, they've been the highest ranked, most listened episodes from our podcast in the year 2023. Firstly, I want to thank all the guests that have been on our podcast this year. feel very grateful uh, for having you on and sharing your stories and your wisdom with our listeners. And of course, a big thank you to all our listeners for, for the year 2023. Make sure to listen to the very end of this episode as I, I have a special giveaway for you, the listeners. Uh, so I want to thank you all for tuning in and let's get straight into this episode. Explain what periodization is and how it relates um, from a nutrition perspective for, for athletes? Um, so periodization is basically the combination of nutrition and exercise often, or it can be solely nutrition, but it's often the combination of nutrition and exercise, how to optimise the adaptation of the athletes. So I suppose historically, you know, you would be periodizing the type of training and then um, how your nutrition matches that type of training to optimise the outcomes and um, it used to be just of the musculoskeletal system, but it's now we know like physiological brain, everything. Like we can periodize certain times, types of training with nutrition and the training that they're doing to help all different um, outcomes. Um, I think that's a basic explanation. What would be some of the differences when you're dealing sort of with endurance, um, endurance sports compared to more power based uh, sports or power based athletes? Yeah, so the endurance sports, obviously, just they've got significantly higher carbohydrate requirements. You know, in theory, you know, the protein is, is spread across the day based on your, your muscle mass, kilograms per muscle mass, which can be easily individualised. But your endurance athletes, they need to be fueling before and during um, their sessions and then have, require a lot more to even recover from their sessions. And then you might have um, some... Look at you also need to be doing gut training with your endurance athletes as well. So you might have a phase. I've got one athlete at the moment progressing to marathons, and we've got nine weeks to do some serious gut training because they need to actually train their guts to absorb carbohydrates at a high enough rate to support their energy output. What are some common uh, mistakes, I guess, when it comes to um, nutrition and how can athletes sort of avoid those mistakes? I guess if we stick with game day preparation and game day performance. Oh, game day, just eat. And if you don't know how to eat or you don't think you can eat, then then work with someone to actually, you know, do that gut training and establish a plan and just persevere. There is, I've had so many athletes say, I can't eat. There's foods that it will work. Like if you can't stomach anything, I promise you, you can stomach a crumpet or start with two dates. You know, there are, there are options to get something in your food, your stomach, so you can actually perform better on game day. Um, and then my other pet hate is assuming things are going to be provided. I think that's really dangerous as an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. Always have your own emergency snacks and try and keep your pre-game nutrition consistent. So once you figure out what works for you, then stick with it. So then game day, you don't have to think about your food at all. You can just focus on what's ahead. What are your sort of your favourite recovery foods and supplements? I guess there's a lot of athletes probably listening in season at the moment where recovery, especially early in the week, is is really important oh really important um look i think a really good quality wpi like a whey protein is, is really handy and i might use that differently with males and females so females i might get them to add it to their food to make sure they're getting hitting their protein and getting that protein distribution whereas a male might have it in isolation but i think that's one thing that most athletes really need and, and can use that to help them recover um the going back to what i mentioned with i think a lot of athletes are misusing or not using at the right time or getting enough of your carbs and electrolytes and getting that timing right around competition and making sure you're getting enough carbs you know at that half time and before and after games and that then adequate carbohydrates for recovery is what helps reduce our muscle soreness similar to caffeine there's responders and non-responders and also uh, how do you sort of cycle it on and off um, with athletes that are in season with um, uh, so creatine, I would I would use it 
in season at specific times if there was different goals. Um, so definitely for athletes that are having a hypertrophy block or if they're working on speed, then that's when I would use it. As far as responders mm -hmm. or non-responders, there's probably usually two in every team that um, it, it does cause a lot of um, swelling in or they don't respond, but it's actually got a pretty small percentage of athletes that, you know, can't tolerate creatine. Um, and then in season, so I might have some specific athletes within a team setting, you know, on it possibly all season long if they're like a power speed athlete, you know, the type with the fast twitch fibres, you know, those athletes, they might be on it um, all season long. How do you develop, yeah, your coping strategies, do you think, to, to um, yeah, handle pressure and be able to, yeah, be able to, you know, not get too stuck in the grand? Yeah, game? I mean, it's... Yeah, it's an interesting question. So one one of the things that we do know is well, when we are under pressure, we 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 um, are prone to this concept called cognitive tunneling, which is basically you know you, you put your blinkers on so you you really focus on one particular thing, um, and that, that's an evolutionary thing which is really really helpful for us because we can put all our mental horsepower to solving that problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, I guess. That if you think about what if you get a you know one of the, the torches the old torches and you know you you can you can do that with it and 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 really get the focus of light really quite small and pinpoint so that's cognitive tunneling performance mindset um, we'll start with a pretty open ended question do you think it's largely inbuilt or something that can be developed whether it be from it's, a coach perspective or or athlete it's absolutely developable absolutely developable. Some people, some people have got a probably a natural proclivity towards it. Um, you know, it might have been role modeled when they were kids, or you know, whatever it is. You know, some people seem to be um, more adept at it. But even people that are not that that you know that struggle in this regard can absolutely train it um, without question. Common challenges point of view, what are some, some solutions do you think? So what are some common challenges that, that developing athletes or even maturing athletes face when it comes to a, you know, developing a performance mindset and a consistent one? And yeah, what are some solutions that you've found have been quite effective? Yeah, look, I, I reckon um, having a really clear understanding of why you're doing something is really important, like a bit of purpose. Um, and, and mission because that's the thing that grounds you. That's that's like your Southern Cross or your Northern Star um, that even when things are going pear-shaped, that that will hold your focus. It's really easy to get into a bit of a spiral and go, oh, shit, it's not working or what, whatever it is. But if you can maintain your focus on you know this positive outcome, this North Star, the Southern Cross, whatever it is, your purpose of why you're doing something that helps you for those athletes listening in what are sort of some i guess scenarios that you found uh, or questions that you ask to help them uncover that if they're struggling yeah. to find it yeah um so, so some people and like a lot of young athletes and whether they're athletes or uh, i do a bit of work in ballet and the like there are some people that do it for themselves and then there are some people that um that are doing it for their parents or you know that, that they're really motivated by not letting people down all those sorts of things so that's that's a bit of an unhealthy way of thinking about it and and not not productive fuel for a for a sustainable career so mm -hmm. the work i do with it is often around how do you how do you develop an intrinsic purpose something which is going to sustain you for a, for a long period of time um and usually that's about um having fun or or discovering what you could do or learning new things now, there are other misconceptions that you find generally people um come in and, and they're seeking a problem when really maybe it might be something different from common other on the part i it's funny, like I actually think that confidence is probably the big one. Like people yeah. come in saying, I'm down on confidence. Um but but usually there is something there there'll be a competence um aspect to it that you just need to unlock. Um 
and then you know you, you, you work from there like whether it's a um a batter not not getting their front foot out of the way or, or whatever it is um then th there'll be a competence aspect to it because you're not competent in it you keep getting bowled out around your legs or you know you're missing set shots or you're missing free throws or whatever because there'll be a competence you just fix yeah, yeah. that's how she light and just fix it um but that's the bit that you need to work on is the competence what were some of the key findings in terms of the difference between the demands of a game for a nab league player compared to afl yeah so it was actually really interesting i mean so i guess if we go back i'm looking at league-wide data so a lot of the research in the literature at the moment you know um particularly around demands of game players, you know, usually done on one team um, or within one club on multiple teams. So, for example, uh, Brisbane Lions up here, they'll do it within their AFL squad, but also their NAB League squad or under-18 squad. Um, I, I, I got access to league-wide data, so it was pretty unique um, and gave some really good insight. Essentially, um, from a demands perspective, the under-18 game is shorter in duration, so naturally, all of your um, absolute demands are going to be lower than AHL um, in terms of total distance, um, high-speed running distance, very high-speed running distance, and so on. But when you actually report it relatively, relative to game time, uh -huh. there's no difference. And the other aspect was looking for trends, I believe, for those that got drafted. What was the... Yeah, so we sort of um, basically trying to create a player profile um, and then do some modeling to see if we can um, identify uh, characteristics that are associated with the player getting drafted or not. So we did a, a positional analysis as well. Um, certain things, so we started off with just physical testing and GPS data, then we introduced technical data as well, um, and we used some, some basic regression modeling but then we looked at some neural networks as well so um base I, I, I mean i guess what you guys want to know that came what came out of it is what gets you drafted um so yeah. i guess basically uh bigger more athletic uh bodies typically get drafted bigger in terms of height or yeah so just general, general, general stature so height and and uh and body mass as well generally how do you use GPS data to um, analyze an athlete's performance? Or do you, yep. you know, that yep. sort of... Yeah, so the, G, the GPS probably takes up, I'd say, 90% of my time. Uh, so it's a massive component of our program at the Broncos. Yep. Um, so we obviously use it to monitor player workloads, um, both in training and games. Um I guess to a deeper level, we're not doing anything that other people are. To a deeper level, we we, we use it to monitor squad intensity um, in key drills. So each of our training sessions in a week will have a certain uh, amount or, or a certain number of allocated key drills. Um, so we look to use the GPS to really quantify um, or, or analyze whether we're hitting target intensities there. And then we do that um from a player perspective as well so um squad level player level what are some of the key metrics that a sports scientist um should be across uh and how do you sort of explain that to i guess to the athlete in terms of what what it all means yeah uh, I, I, I don't think i don't think the metrics are too different well put it this way i'm using the same metrics at the broncos that i was at one years um your thresholds are a little bit different, uh, potentially. Um, so I, I, if we go to the main metrics, everyone's going to be aware of, obviously, your total distance, um, high-speed running distance and efforts, um, very high-speed running distance and efforts. We use a 90% max velocity um, threshold as well. So we'll look at distance accumulated there and we'll look at number of efforts above 90% max velocity. Um, and then I didn't use axles and D cells much in, in footy, in AFL. Um, we use it a lot more in, in NRL. Um, and that's purely just cause it's more an axle D cell line, linear sport. So it makes sense to use them there. I, what are some sort of other technologies that you found have been quite helpful for automation, I guess, from a sports science point of view, those listening in, 
um, maybe perhaps they're studying or, or they're looking to sort of develop their skill set to one day be a sports scientist? What are some important things to get your head around? Yep. So Power BI has been great. Um, I use Power BI every day for just, just sort of my summary reports. Um, feeding into that, uh, and this was a skill I developed or started, actually I started tinkering with um, Python. So most people uh, are familiar with R, um, Python similar to R. Um, I'm not going to argue one's better than the other, but I've just done most of my work in Python. Um, so started tinkering with that when I got back to Brisbane from from Doha, um, just playing around with data manipulation in that. Um, then through the PhD, really developed that skill set because I was working with big data sets. Um, I had to manipulate a lot of things. For those listening in that are working in a high-performance uh, medical team, um, what are some common misconceptions when it comes to communication or, or challenges and, and how do you sort of solve those uh, challenges that we're try to collaborate with and team question. together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think one of the things I'm saying is there, there certainly are differences that, are, that will come from any group that you work with. But there's a massive but there for me and that is often that and then the but or the or the what for is about, well, first of all, if, if they are differences of opinion, they're excited about it. Like it's a really good thing. Embrace it and seek to understand all points of view. And, um, you know, I, I say to people all the time, if you're starting to feel wound up about something, you're starting to feel emotional about a difference of opinion, that's a good thing. Sit in it and listen to it. How often is it that you're focusing on on trying to enhance collab, you know, collaborative thinking and, and integration um, before yeah. I guess, giving them advice? Yeah, well, that's the first step is get, like you want to get everything on the table and get everything out of them that we can because often at all or 90% of the information, it's there. There's just been a little glitch. There's just been a little a little door not opened or a little path not taken that's seen it. Tendon compliance or stiffness lag behind muscle strength, or some muscles get stronger, but one other muscle lag behind. And it may be all really again, secondary imbalances have been generated. It's now leading to another symptomology or something like that. You know, so just mm -hmm. just getting all of the information out of them on the table is the most important thing because often then it's a matter of, well, what if we did this? And in your answer. In terms of meetings, what's your take on that? How, what, how do you sort of conduct effective meetings where people feel comfortable to share their opinions and challenge each other? Um, yeah, so effective meetings, what, what's your take on uh, their duration perhaps or yeah, be wrong meetings, comes running a meeting? Meetings meetings can be a part of that. I mean, we're also busy and we can get caught in a meeting that goes for three hours and say, oh my God, I'll never get that back. But they... they they are a necessity, but short and sweet is better and well agended and concise. So there's the the short patrol right top to tail on the on the list, the priorities up the top, we treat the guys in the bottom and yeah, we're all on the same page. I think the weekend meeting like that is really important. And out of that might come you know, an awareness around oh well, gee, we really need to talk about Jack a lot more. Let's do that afterwards, so let's do that at the end of the day. And how did the whiteboard um, method come to you? Uh, was that something that someone passed on uh, a previous info mentor, or is it something that came oh, intuitively and through practice a, yeah. you found effective? A good, a good example was working with Paul Hodges, Paul the big whiteboarder. So in my very first meeting with him, so I called him and said, look, I want to look at number of we keep control in sprinters and I want to look at hamstrings, I want to do this. And he said, well, look, get your butt across in at Prince of Wales Medical Research Institute where I'm working at the moment. We'll spend a week working in the lab together. We'll get to know one another and we'll talk through what your questions are and we'll see whether or not this is a PhD. Mm -hmm. So I just ruled off a week the patients and flew over to Sydney and spent a week with Paul over there in the lab and... Awesome, it was great fun. But it was often um, either on a whiteboard or while we're drinking red wine at a restaurant on a napkin. Um, he's a very clear thinker. 
but he would always be writing down, so this flows from this, flows from this. And it was almost happy, fresh as himself. Over your time, you've you face a lot of cases for the first time, whether it be a complex injury, uh, and it's really challenging your processes because you haven't had a specific example of, of how to rehab that injury or uh, how to provide advice on that. What, what would be your process for practitioners when they're faced with a, a new problem uh, and yeah. to yeah, have that clear thinking and then to be able to act quickly because you might have to present on the athlete and start the rehab the next day? Yeah, you know. So, you know, you can't, you can't have enough knowledge. There's always going to be things you've never seen before. Groans you've got to go down and you've never been there. And do it alone. No matter how smart you are, don't do it alone. Um, one, because two heads are better than mole. I bring in other people next to you. And also, do not wear the burden and the emotional strain of making a critical decision with, a, with an athlete or a piece of horse flesh worth millions and millions of dollars. Don't bear that responsibility on your own. Involve other stakeholders. Probably most elite clubs try and be multifaceted, have that approach. Um, yeah, what do you think makes Feyenoord sort of unique in this space? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any one thing that you would say, oh, well, they do that that um, at Feyenoord that other clubs don't do. Uh, but I do think that the mix of all of the things together sort of does make us unique in the way that we operate. And it might be difficult for me to communicate that. And if you, someone like yourself came and watched us work for a week or a day, you might see things much more clearly, but I'll do my best. Uh, I think for us, our multifaceted approach is, like I said, all clubs try to do that, but we look at it in sort of four, four pillars or four key areas. And those are uh, uh, movement literacy and, and movement quality. Um, uh, lifestyle, so that's a whole host of things underneath that, but movement is the same. Um, periodization and planning, and then uh, DNA. So like, what do you think are the most important sort of themes to a successful uh, young player developing and over a shorter period of time and hitting those criteria markers that you've seen? I think the team environment and the culture is super helpful. Um, it doesn't have to be there in my experiences, which is not, it's not 30 years of experience, but, um, in my smaller, small experience amount, it doesn't have to be there, but it can be a big booster and a big accelerator. Um, for example, we have, uh, had in the last two seasons, um, two things that spring to mind. One is, a like a breakfast club. I don't know if you ever saw the, the Michael Jordan, the last dance, the last dance mm-hmm. documentary, they had like a breakfast club. Uh, training in the morning with the famous PT now, I forget his name, but um, they were coming in doing weights early in the morning. So we've had a breakfast club running and in the group that we had this year, the breakfast club initially was obligated. We made three players obligated to come because they needed it. Um, and they came in every training morning of the week earlier than the rest of the group and then they had breakfast. For those that haven't done that coordinative base movement, you alluded to France Bosch sort of influence before, um, what, you know, what were some key things that the players were saying that they felt it helped them with in terms of their performance on the field? Yeah, I think that's, is it, is it that for that style and that coordination based training, it's, it's a tricky space because it's not like you have the feeling at the end of a session that like you're completely dead. And, you know, some players more or less want that, like they feel like they've sweated a liter of sweat out and that they're, you know, that, that, or that they've squatted so heavy and they've got muscle pain that that needs to be good for them. Um, with this, you don't really have that so much and it takes time. But in my experiences of training myself, it takes sort of three or four weeks and then you're just starting to feel that extra bit of sharpness in whatever it is that you're working on. Have you found you get more return to effort with working on their efficiency of movement compared to jumping on a bike, let's say, and doing aerobic capacity? Uh, or, do you, or is it not one or the other? It's a little bit of both to get the best result. Yeah, I'm not opposed to 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 the to the both, or I'm not opposed to one or the other. Um, but I do think a case by case. Um, obviously, some players, if you're working with them, to make big coordination based changes, depending on age, depending on training history, depending on injury history, you might be looking at someone who's who's. Uh, movement habits or their their movement patterns are so ingrained in a poor form of stability 
that to get them out of it, it's going to be a 12 month job or longer. Um, in those cases, you might be better off just going for the off, you know, capacity based in terms of traditional strength or conditioning um, off feet or on field. Um, but others where they're young or they have a relatively um, low training history, then you know, okay, within a couple of weeks, I can make, you know, not instantaneous, but quite quick changes for, um, in comparison to, you know, for example, traditional strength is going to take probably 12 months. You mentioned the movement analysis a couple of times now. Is that something that you use some software? Is that your performance analysts that are feeding that back with the sports owners to yourself um, and Ruben, or how does that sort of look? We do that in uh, we do that in preseason testing and all the way throughout the year. So usually we start in context. So actually we just get an iPhone. If I'm filming you, you're in a small sided game, or maybe it's eleven v eleven, or in training is always best because I can go around and move at different angles and whatever else. And I'll just follow you on Zoom. Like iPhone Zoom cameras are fantastic these days. Follow you on Zoom, but the most high intensity periods in your five minutes or whatever it is. Um, it's a little bit painstaking finding those moments. But when you do find them, looking at them afterwards, the process is subjective at the moment um, in terms of the in-context analysis, but making little notes on um, more things that if people want to know about it, looking at the work of Franz and reading his his books and his texts and his courses is, is really interesting. What are the key components uh, of speed development for NRL athletes? I think the, the main thing that um, often gets overlooked is actually sprinting like that's primarily going to be the thing that makes an athlete fast is, is practicing the the task itself um once you get that in place then it becomes about having a systemized approach to develop all the key um, components that underpin running competency so the running skill itself um, and those are going to be things like lumbar pelvic control um, leg stiffness, the uh, ability to switch the limbs rapidly in space. Um, those are sort of going to underpin your, your speed uh, qualities. And then beneath that, you've got like a foundation that's built on sort of your secondary and tertiary training methods that target your leg power. And what are some key things that you sort of take into account when you're assessing an athlete um, and what type of program to give them and how important speed is in terms of like things like positions they play and their age and um, yeah, their physical qualities. Yeah, so we've got a pretty thorough like standardised testing um, battery that we take the athletes through. And for each of those tests, we have benchmarks that are position specific. Um, so talking about some of those like secondary and tertiary training qualities, we're going to assess the athlete's lower body strength. So that can be um, via isometric mid-thigh pull or through a back squat, 1RM. We look at their leg power with a, with a jump shrug and a counter movement jump. We look at leg stiffness with um, drop jump testing. And then we also look at their mobility um, with table testing and, and some screening that we, we can do, like a, a cap stretch against the wall, things like that. For those that aren't uh, working in an elite program, what do you think would be some common mistakes that, um, athletes are work, you know, commonly make them when they're trying to improve their speed by themselves, perhaps. <clears throat> yes, um, there's probably a few things. Um, the first is uh, a lack of uh, intensity in their sprint efforts, and that's usually a consequence of insufficient recovery. So um, if you're trying to develop your speed and you're doing three, four, five, six 40-metre sprints, for instance, on just a walk-back recovery, from rep three onwards, you're going to have so much fatigue in the system that you're just not going to be able to generate the outputs that um, drive the adaptations that you're looking for. So making sure you've got enough recovery between efforts is really important. Um, I'd also say that for the most part, uh, athletes don't really know how to organise a speed session. What were some sort of standout um, learnings in terms of what a successful speed session looks like, I guess, from a strength and conditioning point of view? Um, for, for those listening that may not have seen a, a track and field session or a speed session done in a lead environment. Uh, so what are your big rocks, I guess, when going into planning one? Yeah, it's definitely evolved over the years for me. Um, the way I tend to organise it now is we will take um, 
a good 10 to 15 minutes to do some um, low-level prep before we even go out on the field. In that time, we'll be doing targeted mobility work, um, getting the hips nice and mobile. Um, we'll, we'll be um, doing some activation exercises that are targeting the lumbo-pelvic region, so um, having good control of the pelvis, um, good trunk integrity. Um, and then we'll also just do some g general sort of dynamic movements to raise the body temperature and things like that, get blood flowing. And for those that are uh, injured athletes um, and perhaps aren't able to sprint at the current stage of their rehab, what are some good sort of supplementary exercises or drills that you like to do either on the field or in the gym um, so that when they're ready to integrate into sprinting, they're, they're robust enough? Um, <clears throat> well... It's actually it's quite a complicated question because it can depend on specifically what the injury is that we're dealing with. Um, I like to try and use drilling as much as I can to fill the gaps in what they can't do from a sprinting perspective. So, um, for instance, if we're dealing with, um, let's say, a hamstring injury, um, the athlete will still be able to do a lot of high-intensity drilling, get a lot of high-quality ground contacts, get that calf, ankle, foot complex loaded in a similar way that we would um, to, to sprinting as per normal. Um, we can also do a fair bit of change direction work with a hamstring injury um, because the hamstring isn't going to be fully activated until you've got sort of um, higher velocities or a lot of intent behind a linear acceleration. Yeah. What else is it? Is the, is the purpose of a sport scientist, do you think, in a team sport like AFL? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think... I guess what you need, one of the first considerations when you're, whether you want to apply, apply um, new research or new processes within your program, um, I, I think it's always good to take a trip around the, the research process. Um, so I think if you remember back to, it might be, you might have, anyone might have come across it in high school science or if you, in your undergraduate degree, it, but you can, even if you just look up this, the scientific method, you'll see there's a sort of this process where we start with a research question. Um, we might look into what research or, or, or what we know about the topic area, develop a hypothesis, test with an experiment, analyze some data, and then um, I guess report those findings and then challenge ourselves with another question again. So I think it's important that um, you have a really solid purpose around what you wanna do or, or what sort of research questions um, or question you wanna answer. Are there any other papers or, or feel free to um, talk about your own work as well, where you've you've found that that it's been quite practical in in the approach and and could be quite effective for for practitioners listening in to apply to their trade. Yeah, um, I guess one similar one in that grain that we had, um, we came out about twenty twenty, but we we looked at um we did some sub maximal testing over a couple of years when I was at the Dragons and. And um, Nathan Pickworth, who was the performance manager there, he's now at the Sharks, was was involved in that as well. So um, we did a um, submaximal yo-yo, which is basically just the first four minutes of the yo-yo, uh, quite a number of times over two years. And, and we basically found that um, relative to their own individual, I guess, where we'd normally see them sort of sit, when players add higher training loads over a month, they typically tend to perform better at that submaximal performance test. And it, it, what's your sort of um, go-tos with the small side of games? Is it play load again or heart rate or um, yeah, distance per minute? What are your sort of favourites? Um, well, I think t from a performance point of view, I think, well, Jace Delaney and Grant Duffy have done some good research around acceleration metrics and acceleration density. So that for me, like it's basically just average acceleration per second. I think for me is probably one of the ones that gets missed a little bit and not used so much. And I think that's probably a um, a really important one. Um, mm -hmm. Meters, I guess meters per minute, I think is a is is one to look at. It's typically, um, I think, a good variable because players and coaches understand what meters are. And you, they can have some ownership and some conversation around the conversation when they're um, and they can feel involved in it a bit more if they have an understanding of, of what the metric is. What are some of your sort of key metrics, whether it be in rugby or in AFL, for uh, developing resilient athletes as their sort of non negotiable yeah. target yeah. that you have for individual athletes? And talk us through you know, the data you sort of yeah. reference, whether it be their games um, that they play. Yeah. Position yeah, they yeah, play yeah. 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 Good question. I think the two things are 
the two things are obviously volume and intensity. I think volume is usually the thing that's done a bit easier and, and really well. Like if we can go out there and, you know, we want to do a 12, 13, 14 K session and we can, you know, we're wearing GPS units, so we can definitely, we know when that's going to happen. Um, probably the little bit more challenging thing around that regard is getting it in a certain amount of time or with a particular intensity. And that can definitely be, di it's difficult to replicate training intensity. Maybe when you've got your, I guess, first team versus second team, comparing to the intensity that you might get when you've got, you know, you're playing, in a prelim final or a semi-final. Like in this. terms of uh, a sports scientist, uh, maybe someone who's going into either a, a semi-professional club for the first time as a sports scientist or someone's going into a, um, an elite sport for the first time, where do you think you can make your biggest impact if, you, if you're if you thinking you're going to be at that club for a few years? And as you mentioned, yeah. it can be gradual and that's probably the way to go in terms of building yeah. relationships, but yeah. also putting your, not changing too much too quickly. But um, yeah. Yeah, where do you think you can make your biggest impact uh, as a sports scientist? Yeah. But, yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, I guess the common answer is, you know, we want that the goal is to achieve optimal performance, but then that brings another question about, so how do you go about doing that or what is optimal? But I think as a starting point, the, the things I just mentioned around training standards. Uh, so I think if you can, if you can set some objective criteria, even before you start, say the first training session of the preseason, but be able to set out some, some, goals and some standards around what you think training should look like before you've even started. Going back to your, your career journey, who have been some strong influences or mentors, if you like, that have helped sort of shape your philosophy to date? Yeah, I've thought about this and I don't know if I've just been really lucky or if sport just breeds good people, but I've been super lucky everywhere I've worked. I've just worked with some phenomenal people and, um, and some that I still call friends to this day, but one standout who... You know, I think every time I do a podcast, I just have to mention his name. He's been on your podcast before, but Ben Sapel. So he's still my supervisor um, and he was my boss at the Brumbies. He was the head of performance at the time. And he, I listened to his interview with you actually. And the, the problem with him is just he's too humble and he'll never, he'll never brag about all the knowledge that he has or all the research that he has and how good he actually is. But you know, we still message probably three or four times a week. What have you seen the most effective way to measure uh, how the athlete, like how well the recover, how re well recovered the athlete is, or their freshness, or their you know readiness to to perform? Um, yeah, is it a subjective check in, and um, uh, using your coach's eye and, and seeing how they are presenting, and while you're having a conversation with them, and and, and you know their read on it, on how they're feeling, uh, is it more objective with potentially heart rate variability? Yeah, how, how do you like to sort of see how your athletes are responding to the training load? Yeah, look, there's always, um, I think there's always like best practice, of course, but then there's your environment with your athletes. So in the NBA, for example, like, unfortunately, there is no wellness. There is no heart rate variability. It's very challenging to get um, the players, especially when I first got there, to, to jump on force plates. So monitoring, say, neuromuscular fatigue, for example, um, using force plate metrics was also quite challenging. So in that situation, it really does um, become just conversations. What would influence your decision making when you're trying to reduce load? Well, we're not when you're trying to, but if you're you know, thinking you're going to take a player out of a drill, is it uh, the wellness metrics that you're, you're big on and, that, uh, and, and then re and how the athlete is feeling and when they when you go and check in with them is it more objective is it more just let's just see how they go and try and push them to to get out there and yeah what sort of your approach over pre-season it's such a tough, tough one to answer because i think you know context is king i think that's always always the case and there's always going to be a myriad of variables that are contributing to your decision to do that for me mm. like i always have this performance first mindset rather than an injury risk reduction. I know people throw that around these days and it's become what somewhat of a buzz term, but for me, consistency is the most important thing. Can we just get them out there training regularly? I, you know, and uh, yes, of course, there's always that fine line, but oh, if we push them today, then that means they could lose a week of training and so on. But what can they do? So if they are sore, so we're looking at, say, posterior chain soreness or fatigue, and we're about to go into a speed session. It's like, okay, 
well, do they really need to run at 90 or 95% of their maximum velocity? Perhaps you, you get the feeling that um, they're more just under-recovered or under-prepared going into that session opposed to overloaded. But uh, how do you go about educating, maybe developing players on the importance of you know, living an elite lifestyle? Yeah, so I think that's really important. Um, I got really into behavioural economics about a few years ago, and I realised that a lot of what we want the athlete to do is essentially just a behaviour change. So Mm -hmm. I just read a whole bunch of books and and looked at, okay, how can we actually change the environment to so the athlete actually doesn't even need to think. So it's all sort of set out for them. So it's how we, we place certain items of food at the lunch bar. It's how we set up the whole gym it's how like the flow of it all so I think that's really important um in terms of creating that behavior change but the education piece is also really important how would you manage the sort of group when you're going with those present presentations to make it engaging but also for them to have some key actionables yeah so get rid of the writing they're not going to read anything you can have one number on there or maybe one word um, and then just talk to the slide, but also I- images. So images, illustrations. So how can you sum your point in a picture? Because uh, I'm not going to say all of them, but a lot of them will learn visually. And um, so trying to, obviously we can't do anything kinesthetic and they're going to be listening to me anyway. So I've got to try and hit as many points as I can without using writing. The other one is, Players love to look at videos of themselves. They absolutely love it and they love to look at photos of themselves. So actually getting footage of them, um, you know, in the gym or getting food or something and then playing that because the boys will listen. They'll have a good laugh. How did you go about discovering your style in leadership and and making an impact um, with your own style? Yeah, that's um, similar to that point I said uh, just before about how I set up feedback. Um, feedback hasn't been something that's really come to me naturally. Um, like a one-on-one coffee, really getting into the nitty gritty about how someone's performing. Um, that is, it's a, that's as tough as a human conversation you can have to a point, especially in a working environment where, um, I'll pick out a random example. Let's go I'll pass by so no one gets offended. Let's say Nathan Jones, like his heart and soul is to p- perform on the football field. And I'm going to give him some feedback about how I don't think he's doing that the right way. Like that's a tough conversation for both people. Um, so to have that relationship um, building uh, is certainly that's one thing. Um, and I felt like that was always a strength of mine is being able to get that relationship before um, those conversations. Is it a matter of, you mentioned that you're learning every day. Is it a matter of the more experiences you have by putting yourself out there, getting out of your comfort zone and having those conversations, the better leader you become? Yeah, I've got, I've got a, a really um, in-depth journal that I have at home, which I, I constantly um, write in with things that have happened that day, um, that week. And my old, like, I get I get a little bit of anxiety built up about how I deliver stuff some, sometimes. Um, so I record that and, 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 and go through why would I have had that, ang- that anxiety built, built up? Um, was it the right environment? Like all sorts of things. In, in the end, my... My sort of motto as a captain is to create the safest environment possible for people to flourish as themselves. Um, so every day if I come home and go, I did that again, or I didn't do that again, and I work on, oh, what didn't I do? What does leadership mean to you? What does leadership mean to me? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, I'll answer this in two different ways. One, as a leader, and two, uh, as aspiring to be people that are leaders in my life. Um I think personally, like my motto of creating the safe environment, like it's a leader in, I'm trying to be a non-ego um, that is literally putting pillars up to be able to create the safest environment possible. Um, both, and that's, I'm, not, I'm talking footy, but I'm also, I feel like I've got a bit of leadership in my own family. Um, that's the same thing uh, in my in my house as well. The safest environment for my son, who's now 14 months, um, to be able to live the best life as George Gorn. Um, that's something. And then I get that uh, from my parents. My, my my dad's certainly the leader in my life. Psychological safety, where did you start to really value that as to something that you feel that is so important um, as a leader to, to make sure that your environment has that psychological safety? Is it something because you've experienced 
uh, being as a player that, you know, where you don't feel safe in, in the football club environment, or is it just something you've seen that seems to correlate well with performance or, or how players, you know, enjoy the, the oh, process? Certainly. And I, I, I uh, comfortability it can be bad comfortable in in this in this workplace in this industry um, but being comfortable in your own skin um, that's certainly something that I reckon performance is just it goes like that like Christian Petraka it's hard enough playing AF, AF, AFL imagine trying to play AFL if Christian Petraka is trying to be Travis Boak like he's trying to be someone else. Christian Petraka is the best player of football of Christian Petraka is when he's being Christian Petraka. So to be comfortable in your own skin. How do you how do you go about empowering them to sort of find their own way through their own journey through making mistakes and rather than just sort of copy who they think they should be like? How do you sort of empower them to? So I imagine that can be challenging at a young age yeah. for, for them to. Everyone's got their own journey, but how do you sort of do you influence? Do you try and accelerate that, or is it more just everyone's just got to work it out uh, at their own uh, time? I mean, you'd like a natural workout. Um, you'd like them to be able to, yeah, naturally become the person they want to be. Um, sometimes you do need to show some little fast track around, especially the value. So the one thing that you strip it all back, leadership can be so messy and you try and do this, that, this, that, just strip it back. We've got four values. I try and I try and install those values. I try and behave those values personally. And we just talk those values. We we nut out what those values mean. Like four words on a wall, like that's that could mean anything to anyone. Um, so what does it mean to Melbourne? And then what does it mean to that young player as well and trying to find a happy balance between the two? In your line of work, you emphasise the importance of training coordination over isolated strength. Do you mind uh, elaborating this approach, I guess, for the audience being strength conditioning coaches that might be uh, perhaps following the more sort of traditional model um, of strength training and conditioning? Well, well, first you have to look at the traditional model and see what the weak point is. Um, the weak point, actually there's two things that are really a weak point. Um, the first weak point that I saw that I uh, didn't want is that it's utopian, right? Classic, classic training. Because you find one, uh, let's say, uh, one, one approach with all the details in it that is not just plotting out what the benefits are of the training, but also plotting out what the negatives are. It's not there. They only plot out the positives, and that's utopian. Because mm -hmm. in systems systems body, it's such that if you want to improve one thing out of self-protection, it will decrease something else, right? Something else will go backwards. What would be some of the negative adaptations to that traditional model of strength and power training uh, as examples that... Um, perhaps we're not seeing uh, as coaches or, or or maybe athletes that are doing those practices m might not be aware of the negative effects that are starting to outweigh the positive benefits of that type of training. Yeah, well, one of the, the most interesting things that we came across uh, is uh, when we wrote an article on rate of force development, right? So I wrote it together with Bas van Hoel and he did all the dirty work. I take all the credits. It usually is, but uh, he actually, he's done a lot of good work there. And um, if you look at what's what's out there in classic strength training literature, right, it says that that uh, high uh, resistance um, ballistic training is very good for rate of force development, right? Now, what I said to Bart, to Bart said, listen, you have to look to all the articles you can find on uh, rate of force development and training, right? And what you have to look at is um, what resistance did they use to measure rate of force development against? Do you think traditional strength training negatively influences peripheral motor control? Um, yes, it does. Because um, one thing you don't need in traditional strength training is co-contractions, uh, co right? Uh, because uh, it's the muscle against the, the resistance, and that is where the, the equilibrium ex uh, comes from where if you look in uh, explosive sports, uh, the peripheral motor control is based on uh, properties of muscles, but they need to be activated and that can only be activated by co-contractions prior to uh, the, the moment they have to correct things. So if I run, I have typically swing leg retraction. In that swing leg retraction, I build up the tension in all the muscles. And then when the ground hits the foot, then these muscles can correct 
uh, arrows, and that's peripheral control. And can you explain the difference between attractors and, and fluctuators? I know that's something that you've mentioned before, and perhaps in the context of Australian rules football, uh, if possible, or, or, or a field-based sport, team-based, field-based sport. Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about AFL a little bit. Um, so if you take AFL, right, it's mayhem. It's basically two packs of dogs trying to rip each other apart. But without much structure in it, almost. So, if you have that, then you have a very complex uh, environment, right? And if you look at the body, it's also very complex. You have a very complex body and a very complex environment. If you combine those two, you're not capable of controlling it anymore. It's too complicated, right? So, there's one thing you can do is make your body simpler, right? So where you have 150 joints that can move in all directions, make sure 140 are uh, joints that you don't need to control. And you do that by co-contracting. So a joint gets into its sweet spot and stays there because all the muscles are interacting with each other and you find that sweet spot where you, your joint is strongest. Right? And those are almost uh, self-stabilizing uh, components of movement. And those self-stabilizing components of movements are called attractors. And why do you think ACLs are so prevalent these days in field uh, and court sports like your, your AFL soccer, NFL? Uh, I think, uh, so if, if you're interested in female soccer, it's been now a bigger issue, right? A lot of discussion mm -hmm. about it. And uh, they gave all kinds of reasons. And one of the reasons is also oil coordination. But if you look at... Uh, after we've been looking at all virtually all non-contact ACL injuries, and they're all the same. It's always the same movement pattern that goes wrong. So what you have if you're on the field, you have phase transitions, one organization principle, and then you jump to another organization principle. There could be acceleration to deceleration, could be acceleration to a sidestep, and so, and, and so on. Right. Uh, and if people are not capable of making very clean transitions from one organization principle to the next organization principle, they end up in a position where self-protection is not possible. And that's where the ACLs happens. Thank you for tuning in to this special episode, our top 10 rated interviews for the year 2023 voted by you guys. As I mentioned at the start of the show, I've got a special giveaway for our loyal listeners. If you ranked in, our, in your Spotify rap for the year 23, if this podcast was your top 10 most listened, top five or top one most listened podcast for this year, I want to give back. I want to give you a 30-minute consult with myself. It'll be over Zoom, so no matter where you live in the country or around the world, we'll be able to organize a time, sit down and focus on you for 30 minutes, whether it be how to maximize season 2024 if you're a footballer, perhaps with your parent, and how you guys can work together uh, to set yourselves up for a successful year. Or, of course, for the coaches and business owners listening in, we go through your business plan for the year, how you've set up your marketing, how we've set up your business and your coaching and programming and, and nerd out from strength and conditioning point of view. So uh, I'm flexible. I'll, I'll revolve the 30-minute consult on what you need uh, and I want to give back. So make sure to tag us if you've got uh, that ranking, top 10, top 5, or top 1. Uh, you can tag us on your Instagram story. If you don't have Instagram, just email at me the screenshot of that Spotify wrap at jack at preparelikeapro.com, or you can just direct messages on our socials. Thank you for listening in this year, guys. Looking forward to 2024.